Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff, the AAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have uh, Melinda Suarez Fortado with us today. Hey, Melinda. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you so much for writing your really lovely article. Um, Melinda, where are you located at? So I'm at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, so in the Midwest. Yeah, mm -hmm. quite cold today. Is there snow on the ground? There is snow on the ground. Yes. And, and uh, it was minus 19 with wind chill this morning. So. Brr. Yes. Uh, brr, brr, brr. And so it's January 7th, 2022, as we're shooting this. Uh, and it's not quite that cold in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, we get a little chilly in the morning, but uh, definitely not minus 19 kind of stuff. So what is your, uh, what is your position there at uh, Madison? So I just started a, a NASA Hubble postdoctoral fellowship um, yeah. just last month, which is really exciting. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, um, I have been here just a little over a year. So I, I defended my thesis mid-pandemic in the summer of 2020. Uh, that was interesting. Yeah, so fa fairly new. Uh, and I imagine that was an online um, doctoral it exam? Wasn't, it was an online exam. And I had two kiddos in virtual schooling at the time. So it was, uh, it was really, <laughs> it was a lot. Yeah, yeah. Great. But um, so it, the timing really worked out quite well. It, it allowed me to spend that summer getting settled here in Wisconsin and, and we really love it here. Awesome, very cool, very cool. So Melinda, what do you like to do for research? So I'm very interested in stars and planets. And um, I think for a long time, the community has been thinking about the ways that host stars impact um, their, you know, their companion planets all sorts of ways, right? Um, with radius inflation, for instance, or, um, yeah. So I, I'm very interested in sort of the reverse phenomena with how can planets impact their host stars? And so, um, yeah, both in terms of changes in angular momentum, changes in chemical abundances. And so from both sort of an observational standpoint, I've been looking for rapid rotators and open clusters and looking further to see whether or not they have signs of, um, you know, peculiar chem chemistry. And then from a more uh, modeling standpoint, very interested in what sorts of observational signatures would you expect with what sort of statistical significance. Um, and more recently, I've also gotten interested in white dwarf accretion and whether or not bulk composition um, really can be, you know, uh, determined more from that pathway than from ingested planets. And so looking at it from both of those. Fronts. Very cool, very cool. And that is gonna lead us to this very lovely AJ article, Lithium Enrichment Signatures of Planetary Engulfment Events in Evolved Stars, and Melinda, take us away. Yeah, so first off, I just want to say a thank you to the, the co-authors that you know, helped make this work possible. So this was done with uh, Matteo Cantiello, Morgan McLeod, and Melissa Ness. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was really a lot of fun to work with them. And so the, the question really was, you know, if a uh, star was to eat a Jupiter-sized planet, um, so sort of just starting with the baseline, you know, what sorts of abundance anomalies might you see? Um, and so one of the lowest hanging fruits in terms of abundant signatures to look for uh, is lithium-7. Mm -hmm. And the reason that is, is because it is a really fragile element that is destroyed um, at about two and a half million degrees Kelvin. Yeah, so the intro talks a lot about why lithium is so special. Um, when investigations of chondrites are done, um, lithium is seen to be in great abundance per unit mass as compared to uh, stars. It can be 100, 1,000 times uh, more abundant per unit mass in comparison. And the reason that is, is because, uh, you know, as stars are contracting onto the main sequence and they're purely convective, these central temperatures exceed that lithium burning temperature. And so a lot of the lithium that the star is initially born with um, is depleted uh, as, as the star is collapsing on or contracting onto the main sequence. Yep. But for uh, substellar companions, um, this, is, this, is not, you know, this is not taking place. And so that primordial lithium abundance, which tends to be about 3.3 dex in our solar system um, is maintained. And so if a star is then accreting a significant amount of that material, um, you may be able to see uh, some spike in terms of that abundant signature. Mm -hmm. And generally, 
uh, a star that is, you know, off of the main sequence turn off. So it's starting to evolve subgiant giant kind of all get lumped together in that uh, the lithium threshold for enrichment is generally about 1.5 dex. Okay. Um, and so I became very interested in sort of looking at this using observational data, so a sort of data driven method to say, you know, what should constitute um, enrichment if we just sort of take stars of common masses and common evolutionary states, what sort of variants do you actually expect? And what does the five sigma really look like? And what you see is it's obviously more nuanced than that 1.5 dex is a, a decent threshold for these giant stars, but um, you can have appreciable, strong signatures even below that, depending on, you know, what sort of system you're, you're interested in. Um, in the beginning, we were going to do it fully fully using MESA and use the lithium abundance um, signature, the, the lithium abundance baseline that MESA uh, would, would determine for us. But lithium is very tricky um, because it is subject to all sorts of important mixing processes and prescriptions that may or may not be included in your models. And so when we had this large uh, collection of GALA data that Melissa Ness actually was, was working through, we saw a wonderful opportunity to sort of combine the MESA model to tell us about internal structure, the amount of mass in the convective envelope, but to use the data um, to get a sense of what was nominal for a star at, at a given point in its life. Cool, cool, all right. Yeah, so, um, so that's sort of the intro. We talk a little bit about why lithium-7 and not lithium-6, and I won't go too much into the weeds as to why that is. Um, lithium-7 just tends to be far more abundant, and there are other ways you can make lithium-6, like cosmic ray spallation. And so we focus on that. Um, one of the major takeaways of the paper is that why lithium-7 is very interesting for some systems in terms of tracing ingestion events, that it, it's going to be very important to identify other tracers that would come in tandem um, yeah. with lithium. Okay. And so um, one of the things that we've been spending a bit of time doing is trying to figure out what those tracers ought to be. Um, and you can sort of do that looking at chondrites and, and other sorts of ways to sort of drive your intuition. But another way to do that would be to take a sample of rapidly rotating stars that were lithium enhanced and to try to see in what other ways um, are they divergent from the nominally rotating lithium, uh, you know, normal stars in a cluster? And so that's one line of, of interest that we're pursuing. But here we said, let's just take a post-processing approach. Let's see what happens if you drop one Jupiter's mass of worth of material into the convective envelope, taking all the hydrogen, all of the lithium, sort of smear it in there. And let's compare that to the baseline and the variance that we know from Gala. And let's see where in this HR diagram parameter space are we able to see statistically significant signatures as a result of that? Okay, cool. So in figure one, if you want to scroll down, yeah. um, here is where we're just looking at the GALA data set, which is a very large collection of stars. Um, we started out with, I think, uh, a little over 300,000 and sort of narrowed it in determining uh, you know, some constraints on metallicity and constraints on log G and filled out this parameter space that you see in the CMD here, um, binning stars uh, by the temperature and luminosity to get a sense of what a typical lithium signature would be um, for any point uh, along these MESA tracks that you see over plotted. Um, and then in addition to that in the bottom panel, what the statistical significance, which is fairly uniform comparatively, mm. um, would be. So in the top panel, um, first off, I'll say we're looking at stars between one and two solar masses. Um, and we are really tracing them from the main sequence turnoff point, which is shown with those crosses, mm -hmm. uh, up until this luminosity bump where there are other mechanisms at play that can considerably change the abundance in the convective envelope. So between those regions, first dredge up is occurring, certainly lithium is depleting, all of this should be captured by the GALA data that you're, you're then binning and observing. Um, but there's really not a lot of other processes at play that should significantly change um, the abundance there, aside from adding this hydrogen depleted helium enriched material into that outer convective layer. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so that is uh, so what we did. Another thing you'll see in that top layer, which is probably not surprising to you, is that lithium 
um, is depleted as a function of time, right? So with first dredge up, you should see the lithium signature going down. And really when you start to post-process this uh, you know, material from the, the yeah. hot Jupiter, there are two different things that are happening that sort of work in, in contrasting ways. So on the one hand, lithium is going down. So therefore, you know, this material should make a bigger splash because there's just less lithium. But on the other hand, the amount of mass is going up. So there's more material to therefore dilute your process. So you might see some interesting things happening in, in later figures in terms of colors changing with the abundant signatures. And it's because these competing effects are at work. Also, there's some variance differences as well that, that come into play. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we can go to figure two, which was, I think figure two, if I have it all memorized correctly. Yes, is the one created by Matteo Cantiello. And so this is looking at, um, with a MESA model, taking just one of the stellar tracks, this is the 1.4 stellar mass object, um, looking at the internal structure and the changes in the abundances as a function of time. And so um, in the top plot, if no one has seen this before, it's a, a Kippenhahn plot. Um, and we're looking on the X axis at age and on the Y axis there, you're seeing really a, a mass coordinate. Um, this can be contrasted to that second panel where instead of thinking about the mass coordinate, now you're thinking about the, the radius coordinate. Maybe that's more, more intuitive. Mm -hmm. These green um, sort of uh, hatched regions are showing you the convective zone. So you see that you're getting um, sort of a deeper, more massive convective zone as first dredge up is occurring. That's happening at about 3.5 mm -hmm. uh, giga years there. Mm -hmm. um, and you're, there's a little inset there in that, that middle panel really showing you um, the star evolving along the CMB um, and you know, that it's going from this, this turn off to this luminosity bump. And you're seeing lines also at constant radii. So you can think about as these changes in temperature and luminosity are occurring, mm -hmm. you're also having a change in your size of your, um, your you know, radial extension. Mm -hmm. And this is why actually, as the star is evolving off of the main sequence turn off and it's getting larger in size, one can imagine that close orbiting companions uh, would be therefore at the risk of becoming engulfed. And indeed, mm -hmm. um, this is something that is you know, theorized and seen. Um, we actually see systems that are you know, decaying with time and, and in spiraling into their, into their host stars um, mm -hmm. to occur. So. So that's that. And then in the bottom panel, you're seeing the change in the chemical species. Really three of them are being traced. Um, lithium-7 is being compared to what it would be on the zero age main sequence. You see a really sharp drop, right? As the first dredge up occurs. Yes. Um, and and that, that's definitely expected there. And then that's followed by a change in the carbon-12 to carbon-13 ratio mm -hmm. and a change in the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And those are not uh, you know, isotopes that we really looked at here, um, but it's just sort of give you a sense that, you know, these, there's many species that are changing and sort of timeliness wise how that's occurring. Yep. Uh, similarly, in figure three, we're also still looking at these MESA models, but now instead of just one stellar track at 1.4 solar masses, I'm showing the extent between one and two solar masses. Um, one thing that might pop out right away is that not all of the tracks are being plotted straight from the main sequence turnoff. So if you look at the 1.8 or the two solar mass star, you'll see that it's just sort of a gray line for a while. And that's because these more massive stars really don't have convective envelopes early on. It takes some time right. off of the, the main sequence turnoff for them to generate that. Right. Yeah. Cool. And so the colors are showing you the amount of mass in the convective envelope, which is basically approaching unity as this object is evolving um, onto, the, onto the giant branch. And these salmon, uh, the salmon diamonds there again are giving the, sort of the luminosity bump area. So I'm looking in between there. That peach band that is going down diagonally um, is showing you the uh, orbital separations of what are traditionally called these hot Jupiters. It's 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 AU separations. These are these lines of constant radii again. Oh, okay, got and, it. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully this is clear. This is something that's maybe. Um, hard to to uh, communicate effectively, but the game we're playing is at each point in any of these tracks evolution, we want to ask the question, if it ate a planet at that particular point, so at that orbital separation, either the object is kicked in because there's a dynamical instability or it's engulfed because it was close orbiting to begin with. Yep. We don't worry about how it got there, but if it got there at that orbital separation, at that radial extent, 
you know, what then might be the overall abundance and the statistical, statistical significance. So in later figures, when we're looking at um, the abundance strengths and the statistical significance, each sort of point that we're plotting here is, is a system that we are considering um, where engulfment has occurred then. Is that clear? Yes. Okay, but yeah. in this figure, no engulfment happened yet. We're just sort that's, of looking at the star. Okay, mm -hmm. that's where I was. No um, engulfment has happened yet. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. We will see many more of these figures. All the ones we will see in the future will be either considering the baseline of the star or when engulfment has happened. So we can move on to figure three. Got it. I'm with you. Figure three. Lithium rich giants. Lithium seven signature from engulfment. Yeah, we'll pay no mind to figure five for the moment, uh, which is a fun game we, we play that I'll, I'll talk about. In just well, a we'll second. just take it out of the, out of the view. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so taking that bin data set that we saw of the law data with the overplotted seller tracks, what we're seeing here now is basically that bin nominal baseline lithium abundance for the star, isolated, no enrichment, nothing has happened. How, how strong is that signature? And so the value we're overplotting that's shown in color here is this um, is given in 12 point form. Um, so I think there's an equation that we might want to show someone just really quickly. That would be equation one. Is it an equation one? Um, yes. Okay. Um, no, that's not the one I'm looking for. Okay. I wish I could write on a whiteboard. I will just say the equation because it might even be, oh, okay, that is an example of it. We can look at equation two. So mm -hmm. it's really <laughs> telling you the number of lithium atoms over the number of hydrogen atoms, the mm -hmm. log of this plus the value 12. And this gives you sort of a nice workable number is one, two, three sort of numbers that you can, can think about and sort of make sense of. Um, the, the Typically, you know, this is given in decks here, but um, so this is basically what we're plotting then is it's the number of lithium atoms over the number of hydrogen atoms. And because lithium is so much less abundant than hydrogen, this is why you need to add this, you know, value of 12. This, there tends to be 10 to the 12 more hydrogen atoms on average. Right. And so, so that's what we're looking at there in terms of the, the abundant signature. Right. So in this scale, A of hydrogen would be 12 decks. Right. right. The, the actual equation we're looking at here is post-processing, adding in the lithium supply from the planet. Uh -huh. um, so this is why you see sub P, sub star. So this uh -huh. is sort of the combined effect that we're going to look at a little bit later. But the equation is exactly the same. And it's what we're mm -hmm. taking from the GALA data to get a sense of how, you know, on a stellar track with a MESA model, what would be the expected ALI signature um, okay. at, at each and every point? I like that ALI. Very okay. good. I'm waiting. Okay, back yeah, to I, I hadn't heard of it uh, before I worked on this paper, but now <laughs> I see that it's very commonplace and this is, this is typically used. But every once in a while when I'm talking to somebody who hasn't worked in this arena, they are they, yeah, they're just like, where is this coming from? Good. Okay, so, uh, you know, this is hard to to sort of uh, assess in any way. What do these numbers even mean? What is nominal? Uh, one number that is very important that you might want to put into perspective here is the meteoritic abundance, which yeah. is the abundance that a typical chondrite or a brown dwarf, a rocky body, a very young star that hasn't had time yet to deplete its lithium supply would be born with. And that would be that upper extreme of about 3.3 decks that we're seeing here. So that red those red um, parts of the figure are really showing you where meteoritic abundances, uh, you know, very well could be. So we see that with a solar-like star, a one solar mass star, um, you know, we're we're very much well beneath there because we had a we had a very deep convective zone, um, you know, during that that pre main pre main sequence phase, it, it depleted a considerable amount of this material. But even more interesting, I think, is the figure below where we put it into context of statistical uh, significance. Um, so this now is we are post-processing, adding the enrichment signature um, from the hot Jupiter that has been consumed. And we're asking ourselves what statistically would stand out in terms of uh, the types of systems that might eat a planet. And you know, it, it may be seen as sort of a loss that there's a lot of blue here, a lot of very low sigma information. But what's exciting about that is that if you were to find very strongly lithium enriched systems in those regions, it really points to either other um, possible mechanisms or, you know, an incredible amount of material would have to be
be um, engulfed for this to happen, which is very unlikely. So it really points to the need for either extra mixing prescriptions or things like the Cameron Fowler mechanism, which I won't go too much into, but it's a, a way of a star intrinsically enriching itself mm -hmm. through the decay of another species of beryllium um, that quickly is dredged up to cooler environments that are cooler regions and can decay down. Yep. So those parts of the HR diagram where you sort of come up null um, really is also exciting because it, it points to the fact that because we see lithium enrichment sort of ubiquitously, there are places where it's favorable, but it's found in all sorts of environments, clusters, the fields, all sorts of stars in terms of their masses and all sorts of ages. And so um, it really you know, calls into question the fact that there may be multiple pathways. It also begs you know, the, the question of, you know, is a lithium enrichment signature going to be enough then if there are sort of degenerate ways of enriching? And this is why I think it's quite important to identify a couple other tracers um, chemical or otherwise, that could really point to the sort of progenitor that created this anomalous object you're looking at. Awesome. Nice. So the exciting parts of this HR diagram, again, we want to be below the luminosity bump. So um, we were really looking for things that are uh, earlier than that point. Um, are these 1.4 to 1.6 solar mass stars, where you're able to get just off of one Jupiter's mass worth of material, mm -hmm. a five sigma statistically significant enrichment signature. And that's quite exciting. And so that if you're looking for these things in clusters um, and you wanna find objects sort of near the main sequence turnoff where uh, they either recently or they have some subset of objects that have, you know, um, grown in size and perhaps in Gulf companions, it really points to these more intermediate aged uh, open clusters, you know, um, where you're looking at just a, you know, 2 billion years old or so. These are going to be the interesting sorts of systems where you might expect to find um, stars of the right mass where engulfment could be recent and it could be observationally visible. Nice. Very yeah. Good. Very yeah, so that's very exciting. And, you know, but then the next question, uh, let, let's see what figure th uh, five is before I, I think that I'm, I'm skipping a question that we should talk about first. So in figure five, uh, yes. we play the game, why just one Jupiter's mass of material? We certainly know that there are brown dwarfs out there that are much more massive. Yeah, of course, there's a dearth of them closely orbiting, and that's mm -hmm. a whole interesting <laughs> open question uh -huh. in itself. But you can play the game of how much material would you need to um, engulf in, in a single object. So I'm not really thinking about uh, in that central region where there's, uh -huh. um, there's nothing plotted. Um, there's no substellar companion massive enough to give you a, a, you know, a, a statistically significant signature there. You're not, mm -hmm. it's just never going to happen. Okay. Um, we didn't play the game of what if you ate you know, several brown dwarfs because mm -hmm. it's so sort of far-fetched that, you know, right. okay. 100 Jupiters. But, <laughs> exactly. I'm sure, you know, in every system there is, there is enough, but it just becomes sort of nonsense. But, you know, what's exciting is um, you see that in that 1.4, 1.6, 1.82 solar mass range that you actually have sort of a longer game that you could play where even well into the sub, um, sub giant branch, you know, it is quite possible. And, and yes, you may need more than a Jupiter's mass of material, but, you know, that's certainly quite doable. And what you're asking for is not even in, encroaching into brown dwarf terrain yet. Um, yeah, so that was quite cool. Uh, but the problem then becomes there, we'll get to this later, is can you even expect objects as you're getting more and more massive to appropriately disassociate in these outer regions to give all of their material? And so uh, later in the paper, we'll talk a little bit about, is that feasible? Um, are you disassociating these things and depositing this enriched signature into the appropriate area? Um, yeah. And maybe that's less far-fetched for objects with really large convective envelopes early on. But remember, these more massive objects on the substellar branches can have, you know, much more uh, sort of shallow convective envelopes. And so you want to be, um, you know, you want to be cognizant of that and what goes into disassociating and what sort of time scales you're looking at. Right. Cool. Okay, so we'll go to figure six. You survival times here. Uh, yeah, so table two is going to connect to figure six, which is well, it's all well and good that you have your five sigma statistical significance, sure, but if it's so it? short-lived right. <laughs> that you would really hope to see it, um, then, then you know, that's not really worth looking for. Originally, I was using some of the, uh, 
the work by Lars Bildson, who looked at um, lithium depletion um, on the pre-main sequence and, and really did a lot of the analytical modeling of what that would look like. But I compared that also to, uh, we had the, the GALA baseline information and we could see in that HR diagram the change in lithium as a function of time, which is a very good indicator that if you have a certain amount of lithium in the convective envelope it, at various points in time, what that dilution process is doing to weakening the signature. And so we could compare those two things and we saw that they agreed really nicely. Um, here we're showing in the, the figure, the, the GALA information. And so we're looking at, and GALA of course is taking into account because it's observational data, um, both the uh, evolution of the star itself and right the dilution process and how long that is taking as well. So um, yeah, so we're plotting here now in, in log years, the amount of time that an object uh, or that particular signature would take to completely be wiped away. Um, the stars are showing you um, the points at which the convective base of uh, the convective envelope is reaching that lithium burning threshold. And so one thing you could just do as a rule, if you wanted to do a very toy model is to say at that point is when you're destroying everything, but no, mm -hmm. it's more nuanced than that. And there are, you know, there's obviously other considerations that are quite important. And so again, I think the data driven um, way is, is always a good way to go to kind of sanity check, but um, we can go back to the table. So the table just basically summarizes the, um, for each of the stellar masses, what the maximum lithium survival time is, which those are you know, earlier in the star's evolution, so closer to that main sequence turnoff. And what is very exciting for me is that 1.4 to 1.6 solar masses where we saw that we could get statistically significant enrichment, we also can get fairly long-lived phenomena. And this, you know, as somebody who wants to possibly do some observational follow-up of rapidly rotating giant stars, um, and and subgiant stars. This is this is interesting for me. This means that there is some hope of possibly seeing this anomalous signature. Nice. Very yeah. Cool. Very cool. Okay. Uh, so. Second part of Figure Six, there. If you want to cover it, or. Yeah, the bottom part of Figure Six is just sort of giving take, giving the reader the takeaway. If you only cared about regions where signatures lasted longer than a million years. Okay. and we're stronger than three sigma, okay. um, you know, let's plot that. And so you see it's a very small subset. So once again, you can take away, oh, it's, it's really hard to look for this in lots of systems and maybe that is sort of a negative thing, but no, that means all of these other places where you find enrichment, um, this means that there's more to the story. And, and that's, I think that's a very exciting, um, you know, uh, situation to be in, but it also means that we have, we're able to narrow down you know, good air, good places to be looking for these sorts of things. So looking for rapid rotators at the moment in clusters that are about these masses is very appealing. And, and then following up with um, high resolution spectroscopy to say both is the lithium there, but what else is there? And in what other ways is this different than sort of the nominal cluster population um, mm -hmm. is very exciting to me. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. So for figure seven, um, we can go to the top one. Yeah. We get into the um, slightly more pessimistic regime where we say, let's, let's take the most conservative approach in whether or not this object would dissolve. So for a very long time, okay. the idea was you were ablating the material um, from this, this uh, planetary object. And the way that you knew whether or not ablation was happening was depending on the virial temperature uh, of the object of where it was in the star. And assuming that the virial temperature was, was strong enough, then okay, you can go ahead and ablate everything. It's a very, very liberal idea. Um, uh, more recently, Gia and Spruitt looked at the idea that what you really want to consider is um, the ram pressure effects of this sort of density gradient of stellar material that the planet is bumping up against mm -hmm. and how that compares to the gravitational binding energy. Okay. Um, it, it, it leaves out, I think, an interesting look at before all of that, the tidal disruption, the radial inflation of the planet. I think that it's, it's far more conservative in, in the fact that there are other mechanisms at play 
that very much earlier on could have been liberating material. It also completely ignores the fact that, you know, is lithium uniformly deposited in these planets? Would you expect to find it more in the outer confines or closer to the core? None of this is really being considered. It's saying if it's just homogeneously spread, and if we sort of ignore all these tidal forces, and we just need to unbind gravitationally this object via RAM pressure, um, would we expect this to happen and how much material will be deposited? And so Matteo Canciello added a, um, a, a module, I guess, to the, to the Mesa Stellar Evolution Code that actually could look at that ratio of RAM pressure um, to gravitational binding energy and could see how much material would be deposited into the convective envelope um, yeah. at each of these points. Good. And so it presents a very pessimistic case where all of these exciting regions where we would have found this five sigma statistical significance, right. you should not expect um, if this is the mechanism necessary to deposit that material to take place. But we know that planets break up long before they're engulfed. You know, you see rings and debris disks and material raining on. And um, so I think it's it's a far too conservative. The more liberal approach of let's think about just the, ran the uh, you know, the ablation effects said, oh no, you definitely can deposit everything just up to about 15 Jupiter masses. So I think we're somewhere in between here where, you know, both are important, but I, I don't think it's, yeah, yeah. we're able to sort of close the book. It's, I think it's still worth looking, but I, I want to also mm -hmm. present this case that, you know, things are nuanced and challenging and it may, very well may be um, that for some of these systems, particularly the ones with the shallow convective envelopes at 1.8 to solar masses, it's very difficult to get the material where you need it to be to be observable. Okay. Right. Okay. Good. And then um, going down the next panel, it's just the statistical significance of these same um, these same tracks, yeah. which basically is showing you this very pessimistic case that it's it's quite yeah. low. So the yeah. tracks that remain, which we already saw in the other figures, they could match. Um, you know, is sort of these more um, slightly pessimistic cases. Wow. Right. Okay. So figure eight. Wow, right. Okay, figure eight. Uh, here we go. Uh, this is really to, I think, make, help the audience or the readers um, understand or I think feel excited about the fact that um, engulfment is not uncommon, okay? So we're seeing orbital distance on the x-axis versus the surface gravity of the host star. And this is basically you know, taken from the NASA Exoplanet Archive, all of these confirmed objects okay. or candidate objects. Uh -huh. um, and we see uh, them over plotted. And in that yellow bottom region is where the, the hosts are still in this dwarf phase. They have not evolved off of the main sequence turnoff. Uh -huh. And then above that, we have our giant, uh, subgiant and giant stars. Okay. Over plotted in these lines are the Mesa stellar tracks basically showing you the radial extent in that orbital distance here um, as they're going from the main sequence turnoff um, and, and getting larger in size, um, marching along the red giant branch. And what you see is that sort of paucity of objects in that left-hand quadrant. You know, why are there no post main sequence stars with tons of planets orbiting around them? It's because all of those objects would have been engulfed. They'd be inside host stars that are one 1.4, 1.8 solar masses. Mm -hmm. And what that also means is that a lot of those objects that we see that are currently below the line that are they're orbiting these dwarf stars, these are objects, um, most of them, by the way, in this exoplanet archive are orbiting you know, G type stars. So this is just basically, we can sort of think about them mm -hmm. um, as, as it often cases orbiting stars that are similar to those tracks but many of them will be engulfed. And um, there's been a lot of work showing that that number may be close to like 30% of planets orbiting G-type stars will eventually um, be engulfed. And so here we just sort of take away from that census that it's a fate awaiting many of the objects we already know about. And, um, and, and many people are seeing tidal in spiral um, at the moment. They're seeing changes in the period as a function of time. Um, and, and that's quite exciting. So uh, I think that there's a lot more of this to come. And in fact, there's a few of us that are planning to host a couple conferences, specifically thinking about the end demise of planets and what we can learn from that, both from the giants and the subgiants and the white dwarf. And mm -hmm. so I think it's an exciting new area of research. And not only do we learn about the internal mixing processes of stars in areas where we wouldn't expect engulfment to be important, not only do we learn about anomalous rotation and the roles that planets play there, but what's most exciting is 
um, for white dwarfs and, and stars and clusters where you can find these signatures, you may be able to back out information about bulk composition. And that can tell you a lot about how and where planets form. And so it's kind of beautiful to me that from this end demise, the death throes of, of the planet's final stages, you really learn things about these earlier times and their birth. Um, and it's one of the only ways I can think at the moment that we can say that because while James Webb Space Telescope is gonna tell us amazing things about atmospheres and biosignatures, um, in terms of bulk composition, that's really not um, gonna be a question that we can explore in that way. And so the stellar astronomy community, I think can play a major role in, in tandem with the exoplanet community in understanding the composition of those objects. And I think that's, that's quite exciting. Well, I like your previous adjective, beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I think that's just lovely. And then we end off the article on discussing some of these possibilities, some of the Gala database, and on through is what you. And lots said. of promising systems are presented too. Of either systems that may have already engulfed, and why we think so, and systems that we think are on the way. Okay. Um, so people who might be interested in exploring those further can find that as well. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice, Belinda. Thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely AJ article. Thank you. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Uh, and you touched on it a little bit uh, as, as you went through, but uh, I'll, we'll go a little more pointed uh, here. So let's let's take a future look. So so where do you think this goes over, over uh, you know, let's say two to five year time scales? You mentioned several different possible directions, uh, you know, rotating stars, um, and other things, but are there are there additional theoretical calculations? Is maybe there are some laboratory astrophysics involved? I mean, what uh, where do we go from here? Yeah, so the the lowest hanging fruit, or the thing I've already been spending a lot of time working on. So I do a lot of photometric analysis of variable stars and clusters. That's what my a lot of my thesis actually was focused on using um, the original Kepler data, which has these super stamps that haven't really been fully exploited yet in terms of looking for anomalous rotation, pulsations, exoplanets. So you sort of get a lot of science out of them. And at the moment, we're mining through you know ten thousand some odd light curves, and by we students that are doing an amazing job in terms of classifying these stars and flagging them. Um, and so we have a, a subset of population that we've been curating where the rotation looks to deviate from the typical rotation. There's a really beautiful convergence of rotation on older clusters that you see as a function of their mass. Um, and so that's, that's quite cool. And there are these deviants. And so these are the objects that we would love to follow up with um, high resolution spectroscopy. So there's uh -huh. instruments here like NUID that we have access to. Um, that uh, I think it would be very exciting to do that. I know Rich Townsend's been working on creating synthetic spectral um, grid interpolators. And so this idea that we could read in lots of synthetic spectral models and get a sense mm -hmm. of in what ways are these stars anomalous. We could also compare them, um, like I said, to these, mm -hmm. um, these nominal populations. And Anne Bozgard has collected a really wonderful main sequence turnoff um, survey of, of abundances. So that data already exists and would be possible to leverage. So that's all quite exciting in terms of the observational follow-up, um, but I'm also very interested in, in possible tracers. And mm -hmm. so um, would love to talk to anyone out there who might be interested in thinking more about beryllium or deuterium, cesium. There are these sort of objects that tend to be stronger in chondrites. And yep. now thinking about how do you observe them? How else do you define the continuum there? Is this observable from the ground? You know, there's all these sort of limits economic sort of situations and, and logistical boundaries here that you bump up against, but mm -hmm. it, it does look somewhat promising. And then I've been playing a lot with um, white dwarf uh, UV spectra mm -hmm. and trying to understand the abundances that we're seeing and whether or not there are any, any sort of clues as to interesting species that we could be looking for. Yeah. Very yeah. Nice. Very nice. Well, this seems like a very awesome research direction, and I really look forward to seeing um, your next couple of papers over this over the coming years as uh, we figure out this, this uh, wonderful mystery. It's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Frank. Oh, thank you, Melinda. And that will do, everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better, and we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>